Thank you everyone so much. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, please use the chat feature to tell us where you're from and say hello as thank you to those who've already done so. Also, please take a moment to answer our opening poll if you haven't yet done so. My name is Elizabeth Lang and I'm with the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center or the Center for short. The Center is a, a partner in human trafficking education, healing support services and resource identification. We offer no cost assistance to tribes and tribal serving organizations with starting, sustaining or growing your anti-trafficking work. Today's talking circle is sponsored by the Center and let's go ahead and get started. We're really excited to have you all with us today. And now I would like to welcome our moderator, Tracy Stathis, and over to you, Tracy. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's nice to be here today. And I work with Elizabeth at the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center and want to thank her for being our greeter and welcoming everyone in our room today. So as she mentioned, our discussion today is on broadening your circle of support and really focusing in on those resources to help healing in your tribal community. And we really look forward to hearing our panelists' perspectives on available federal funding, managing program operations, offering culturally sensitive services and healing programs, and being ready to respond to survivor needs in a trauma-informed way. We are honored and grateful to have Greg Gray Cloud with us to center and ground us today with an opening song. Greg is a member of the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe and co-director of Wicha Agli, which means return to man. This organization is a native men against domestic and sexual abuse nonprofit located on the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Greg is also an equine therapist, focusing on using Lakota horse culture and helping boys from grades K through 12 heal from sexual violence and childhood trauma. He actively promotes the prevention of violence against women and children and works diligently to end violent crime and gender inequality in his community. Greg, we um, welcome you and are honored to have you with us. I turn the time over to you. for the introduction and welcome to all our relatives who are here. My name is Charging Lance and uh, the song I offer for us today is specific to offering your voices towards the center. <clears throat> the song uh, says, I'm sending my voice. I'm sending my voice to the creator on this day. Uh, as common people, we are sending our voice today from the center or towards the center. And we're asking our voice to be heard. So uh, at this time. <clears throat> Ho ye ya ya ho ye ya ya hey Ho ye ya ya ho ye ya ya Tong ka she la le ha be lo hai yo I che we cha sha ka ho cho ka ki le yu ha ho ye ya ya Oh yeah, yo, tonka she la lay a bello yo. Yeah, what will a tonka teacher me talk with? Oh yes. Thank you very much. You guys have a good day. Thank you so much, Greg, for being here, and he'll be joining us again to close us out. We really appreciate you yes, and your your talents and all you're doing for your community. Okay, yes, thank now, you very much. thank you. Joining me are our three panelists, Desiree Coyote, Michelle Cook, and Shelly Jacobs, and I invite each of them to say hello and offer a brief introduction. Desiree, let's start with you. Good morning, and thank you. My name is Desiree Coyote. I am the Family Violence Services Program Manager for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. I've been doing this work since 1995, been with the tribe since 2002. I am Nespers on my father's side, Umatilla Walla Walla Cayuse on my mother's side, and I'm an enrolled member of this tribe. I'm also, I also serve as a field advisor 
for the Human Trafficking Center. Thank you, Desiree. I'm grateful to have you today. Um, Michelle, let's go to you next. Sego, hello. My name is Michelle Cook. I am the Community Advocacy Program Manager at the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, of which I'm also an enrolled member. I am also a member of the New York State OPDV Intellectual Developmental Disabilities Domestic Violence Advisory Council, and I have worked for my tribe for 18 years. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome. Shelly, let's go to you. Hi, my name is Shelly Jacobs. I work for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, the Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Lead Advocate. I have been working in the field um, about 15 years and I am a domestic violence and sexual assault survivor. Thank you, Shelley. Welcome. We're so glad you're here and thank all of our panelists and you participants here today for sharing your time with us and being a part of this discussion. So I have a few of my own questions for the panelists and then I invite everyone in the audience to add their question to the Q&A below. Um, Shelley, I'm gonna start with you. What non-funding resources are available to support tribes in offering victim services? Um, when I look at the tribe that we have, I always look at the client and how are you getting the client? Um, police referrals, it could be from a crisis call. It could be self-referral. It can be coming from an, another agency. So then you have to look at the immediate, immediate needs and is that uh, safety? Do they need a safe place to stay? Are they hurt? Do they need to go to the hospital? Which hospital are they going to be going to? Most important thing is know your community, know what programs the tribe has to assist all members. Develop a good relationship with the police. They can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And they're going to ensure the clients that they are safe in working with us when we start their journey. So when we start from the beginning, it's all about safety planning and it's about listening to the client, ensure that you are hearing their story, believe the client, support the client, and follow their immediate needs. Emotional support is a free service. You can offer it and always provide that emotional support. Um, start with the safety planning of your client, how they got to domestic violence or sexual assault, what are the shelters available, transition housing, faith-based organizations, DSS, uh, your homeless shelters and affordable housing, food. Um, how do you assist them on getting food? Do they have tribal food distribution programs, your family advocates? How do you help them obtain SNAP benefits? Local churches, food banks, give them a list. Um, clothing and uh, goods. Know what agencies offer new or used dental clothing, um, Goodwill, Salvation Army, St. Vincent de Paul, our AMVETS, and we break it down to medical. Do they have tribal ID? Can they go to the clinic? How do they access traditional medicines? Community health centers, do they have to fill out applications forms? Do they have Medicare? Where can a veteran go to receive services? Where can they get vaccines? What are the free clinics in the area? And when you look at mental health, where's your crisis centers? Drug and alcohol, where's the detox centers? What's the crisis centers? HIV, AIDS, prevention detection programs, guide them in the right way. Community outreach programs, do they need them for transportation? For the younger women, WIC helps them with nutritional. For the legal, know your court, know your judge, and develop a good relationship with the police officers because that's who you're going to be dealing with, whether it's victim of crime, sexual assault, or your um, domestic violence unit. Pay attention in the court on which lawyers are getting the results because those are the lawyers you're really going to want to push your clients to try to get. And how do they apply for a public defender? Depending on the county, could be different forms. Employment. Do they want to work? Um, jobs available in the area? Is there any online trainings? What are their local employment agencies? What are their transferable skills? How do they write a resume? How do they write a cover letter? Education. 
continuing education in the area? Is it available? Do there, is there any online education, schools for the children, any high schools, adult continuing education, college courses, even the GED? Going to transportation. Does your client have transportation? How are they going to get to the appointments? How will they get to work? Is there buses? Is there a ride share program? Um, victims of crime compensation. Uh, this can be found at the OVS for us. I'm in New York, so it's OVS, New York.gov slash victims of crime. Um, four things that I need you to remember. Listen to the client, believe what they're saying, support them, and don't judge them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, you know, working together is really foundational, and you shared so many ideas of where to start building those relationships and your ending comments that each survivor is really unique and central to their healing. So think of those people you're working with and who to involve when you're ready to support the survivors and where they'd like to go. You know, relationship, relationship, relationship that came through in all of your remarks. Thank you. Okay, Thank my you. next question is for Desiree. How do you use federal funding to support your victim service programs? And would you share some examples? Definitely. Thanks, Tracy. And thank you, Shelley, for providing the foundational victim services uh, arena. That was excellent. On top of that, on, on doing those, uh, providing victim services, what we use federal dollars for, we look at uh, victim services and social change work and then criminal enhancement, criminal justice enhancement. So some of the funding that we've uh, put to use was for consultants. For instance, when we have uh, staff retreats, we'll bring in a presenter or two with um, the different areas that we want to enhance our skills on. Or for our MDTs, we'll bring in, uh, like we did one for uh, child welfare and intimate partner violence, so our restorative justice type training. The other piece that we do every other year, we host a travel state and federal summit and that takes in pretty much the Pacific Northwest. This past August, our focus was on uh, healing-centered engagement, moving beyond trauma-informed care with uh, tribally specific data and experiences. So we get a chance to host them, make sure you follow the guidelines within the grants. Uh, there are specifics to each grant. We also use that money to look at uh, how our safety and accountability is for our community. For instance, uh, after we were able to prosecute non-natives in tribal court, we hired an evaluator to come and take a look at that data. And then we also asked that evaluator to come back four or five years later to do a comparison on uh, VAWA and non-VAWA sentencing and prosecution. Our most recent uh, assessment that we did was around sexual violence in the tribal community, which was a two-year process, but it was a really, really interesting piece, working with the evaluator, trying to understand the context from, from the researcher's point and, and our point as a tribal community, uh, getting to the data that we needed. So if you get a chance, definitely find a good evaluator that can help out. Um, we also use the money for legal services. We hired an attorney, uh, being rural frontier. Most of our clients uh, conflict out with uh, free legal services or local attorneys. So we hired an attorney and a coordinator to assist us in tribal court and state court. We uh, applied for uh, housing funds to help our victims, our, our, our sorry, victim survivors. Uh, with housing rent up to three months, including utilities or moving costs. Some of the funding we also used for uh, trying to get a sexual assault nurse examiner into our community. Again, being rural frontier, that can be very hard to do. And most of the nurses who do become SANE certified, they are offered better positions in the cities. So trying to keep them here has been been difficult. So, so we put monies in a, one of the federal grants to train four nurses and get them certified within Oregon. 
we ended up with two nurses uh, that was certified. We also use the money with our students. Our staff work with our tribal high school and we have them uh, weekly during class hours, but we also take them on our uh, national conferences that we attend, which is a highlight for a lot of the students because uh, getting out to see new areas and learning about uh, the kind of work that we're doing and trying to address for our tribal community. The other piece that I do want to share, and this is not, I, I could go on about what we do with our funding, uh, but we also hired a, a law enforcement policy analyst years ago, and the job, uh, the position was set up so that he would not just monitor the cases around domestic violence and sexual assault and how they were being investigated and processed through the prosecutor's office, uh, but he also um, monitored the training. So, so whatever he saw that, that might have been a hindrance in the investigation or the lack of uh, training that they need or training to enhance, then this policy, law enforcement policy analyst would take a look at all of those pieces. Uh, and oftentimes that was not just for our, our tribal law enforcement. He would look at what was going on within the state and nationally to uh, better look at keeping our community safe. So, so I will stop there as I tend to go on. Thank you, Desiree. And for those of you listening, maybe there were some new ideas in there that Desiree shared about how federal funding can be used in your work. And just want to emphasize that federal agencies can be partners and collaborators in helping fund those areas where you see a need and a gap in services from staff training to new staff positions and just thinking creatively and having those conversations. I'm gonna do a little plug here too, because it's so timely. Next week on November 9th, which is a week from today, the Office for Victims of Crime is holding a tribal consultation on the Tribal Victim Services Set Aside Program. This is for tribal leaders and their designees, but anyone is welcome to listen in. And that's funding that's available annually through the Office for Victims of Crime for Victim Services. So I encourage you to attend that and learn a little bit more about that funding stream. Okay, and I see some questions coming in. Participants, you've got a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience in this panel. So feel free to start dropping your questions in. We'll get to those shortly. Um, my last question is for you, Michelle, before we move to our live Q&A. And my question is, uh, staff turnover can be challenging. How can federal funding support both training and retaining staff to serve tribal communities? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Tracy, um, Nyawa, to everybody who's answered before me. Um, we have a lot of great information here. So because of the trauma that comes along with human trafficking, as well as other forms of violence, Staff are going to need training and support in order to serve the victims and survivors, um, especially in how to avoid burnout. So one of my first suggestions is in training is how to utilize your TAs through your federal awarding agencies. They're great resources uh, for any specialized trainings, um, you know, such as vicarious trauma, debriefing, com compassion fatigue. Um, Another thing is to set aside days that are specifically just for training and not working with your clients. This may not always be possible, but scheduling a day with no appointments is, is very helpful to take a break um, and to learn something new. Uh, provide new staff with as much training as possible regarding working with the trauma victims, uh, crisis response, et cetera, so that they're prepared for the work they're going to be doing in the future. Um, supervisors should also have training on uh, especially being an emotionally intelligent leader, recognizing the signs of burnout in your staff and yourself. Um, staff retention is, as we I'm sure we all know, is um, a big issue. One of the things that we do here at the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe is staff development, which is an annual day of team building and wellness promotion that's done on an in individual programming basis. The first half of the day is to focus on activities that promote team building, going on hikes, kayaking, things like that, while the remaining second half of the day would be centered around wellness activities like yoga, meditation, or art therapy. 
Also having access to a trauma counselor is very important. Um, we have one who's contracted for both victims and our staff members. Um, he works with not only our domestic violence program, but also tribal police um, because you know they see a lot of trauma. They need the debriefing as well. Encourage the responsible use of paid time off. Just reiterate that mental health days are sick days. Many employers offer an employee assistance program. Um, they're anonymous, free for employees to utilize. I know in rural communities, everybody knows everybody. Um, it may not be comfortable for your staff to go to your local clinic to receive mental health counseling, where it could be a neighbor or a friend of a friend who's that, that counselor. So EAPs are extremely important. Also practice good and open communication with your staff. Ensure that your staff know to come to you when they're feeling overwhelmed, when they're feeling burnt out. Um, don't penalize them for that. Uh, like I said before, learn to recognize the signs of burnout in each of your staff members. And ask your staff how you can help them. Um, you know, debriefing, um, getting rid of their emotional baggage is going to look different to everybody and everybody's going to want to debrief in their own way. And the biggest thing, and I'm still learning this myself and trying to practice this myself, but despite how very important and significant our work is, remember it is just a job. Your home life and your self-care should always come first. You're not going to have any staff if they don't feel appreciated, valued, or heard. And I can guarantee you've all heard this expression before, you can't pour from an empty cup. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that reminder that we have to take care of ourselves and our staff in order to be there for, for others. And I also love how you and Desiree talked about how you addressed the challenge of rural communities. In one case, Desiree was funding people to come in. And in your case, sometimes it's helping people get out to see other services that they may need. So I just love the kind of creativity that comes as you get to know the people that you're serving and the resources available to you in your community. Okay, the questions are starting to roll in. So um, I'm gonna start, this is so close to your response, Desiree, we had a couple questions in here just about the nurses um, that you mentioned using funding for, if you could talk a little bit about how that came about. So uh, we applied for a rural grant and I uh, used that to uh, obtain the nurses. And I was a part of the county sexual assault response team. And we developed, we looked at many ways in, in trying to enhance services for our, our sexual assault rape victims. And part of that, part of that agreement was that I would write that into our, our tribal grant. Uh, Oregon is set up through the sexual assault task force. They have uh, guidelines in regards to sexual assault nurse examiners, and they also uh, have a certification process for uh, SANES that um, we all complied with. The SANES, of course, like I mentioned, uh, once they become skilled in rural frontier Oregon, they are often picked up on the I-5 or, I'm sorry, the cities of Oregon. <laughs> I forget when they're not all from Oregon. And it, it's frustrating. I, and it's also frustrating for the hospital. So, so sometimes our local hospital, which is like six miles away, they will have a SANE for a short time and then they're gone. So we have to drive them up to um, about 45 minute drive north to take them to a, another hospital. And they're, they usually pretty much have a, a SANE but during COVID, it got really hard. So we ended up having to go up to um, Washington State, either Walla Walla, Washington, or up to Tri-Cities. But check, check with your uh, state and see if they are uh, certifications or uh, TA for that. I, the Sexual Assault Task Force for the state, they do provide training and technical assistance and are happy to uh, train uh, sexual assault response teams also. Hopefully I answered that question. Yeah, thank you very much, Desiree. So our next question I'm gonna to send to both Michelle and, and Shelly. It's from uh, 
state administrating agency of VOCA funds, um, which Shelly, I know you mentioned as someone to develop a relationship with. Um, and they are asking how can they develop relationships with some of the tribes in their area, connect with tribal organizations to fund these programs. Maybe they haven't done it previously and just looking for any best practices or um, ways to develop and build and maintain that relationship. Um, I know for me as an advocate, I'm gonna call you. I'm just gonna call you, I'm gonna email you. Um, just like, hey, what's going on? Every community has local events, sexual assault, human trafficking, DV, all these events, invite them. You can invite them over, webinars, team building, team meetings. Um, so I just invite everybody and that's what I do. One of your best point of contact would be to get in touch with any of the tribal council offices that are in your state. Um, they'll be the best way to direct any inquiries about how to develop a relationship with that tribe. Um, I know our tribal council's office, they have um, office managers who will field the calls um, and pass any information along to tribal council members. Um, another good resource, you know, might be the tribal clerk's office, for example. They may know who to get in contact with. Um, and just to provide long lasting relationships, I would just suggest a communication, um, invite to site visits, um, you know, engage, be aware of any cultural nuances. Um, you know, not all tribes are the same. Um, so get to know, um, you know, the, the cultural nuances of each tribe that you're working with. All right, thank you, Michelle and Shelly. And I'm gonna just do an add on, maybe Desiree, you could take this one. If you could talk a little bit about VOCA and state funds, because as program managers, you're often getting funding from lots of places. So if you could talk a little bit about what that funding stream looks like, VOCA through your state. I have uh, state VOCA and federal VOCA for my funding sources is one of many. So we are fortunate in Oregon that uh, Crime Victim Survivor Services Division is really good about partnering with tribal nations, uh, not just in helping them uh, develop or look at RFAs, but in developing the proposals. Uh, they're also help, they help in regards to managing and monitoring their own, uh, the work that they're doing and the funding that they have in spending out. Um, Oregon VOCA, it's uh, usually used for um, like victim witness uh, assistance or uh, like we used it for direct services for, for victims. And the federal VOCA that I have, that one I wrote specifically for the um, sexual violence and tribal community assessment where I hired, I, I partnered with an evaluator in writing that proposal and we finished it at the end of this year. So both uh, in working with the federal uh, grant manager, sometimes they're usually pretty good about responding back to me with a phone call or an email. I find it quicker that way. And then with the state funder, again, uh, kudos to Oregon grant managers for working with us tribes in a meaningful way, not, not uh, no judgment or anything. They, they do their best to walk us through what we need to walk through. Um, and Oregon has ensured that tribal nations were at the table in, in developing those RFAs and the implementation uh, plan for the state since uh, 2010, and they've come a long ways. All right, thank you, Desiree. And FOCUS stands for Victims of Crime Act funding, right, that gets channeled down to the states for um, distribution. Okay, um, this question is on um, training. So um, Michelle, let's start with you and then go to Shelly. You both kind of mentioned training. If there are some training that you would recommend um, people take, you could talk about that, please. Sure. Um, so we have, and I'm 
I'm sure this goes across the board, a 40 hour domestic violence training, the 40 hour sexual assault training. Um, there are a few, um, and in New York State, we have the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, I sign up for their newsletters. Um, there's coalitions in other states as well. Uh, if you sign up for their newsletters, they will provide training updates. Um, one of the ones that I did take through New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence was being an emotionally intelligent leader. Um, the National Indian Women's Resource Center is another excellent um, resource for training. Um, most of your funding agencies, like you know, the Department of Justice, will OVC will have newsletters out periodically um, with all of the trainings that are taking place, whether they're virtually or in person. Um, I attended the um, National Victims of Crime Training Institute in St. Louis uh, last month. That was extremely helpful. Um, it provided a lot of information. Um, the advocates at, here at Three Sisters, um, they all attended virtually. So it's there. A lot of them are pretty flexible. Um, so the, those are the ones I could suggest. I don't know if Shelley has any others. Um, I do the forty-hour review at once a year on domestic violence and sexual assault. And another great one is Fat Online. It's 52 slides on everything from domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, harassment, uh, the justice system. Um, it's really, really useful. I use it all the time. All right, thank you. Um, Desiree, this question came from the chat and I'm gonna have you start. It is, how would you recommend a community expand its victim services programs to offer more comprehensive support for victims? Good question. <clears throat> I haven't been a part of this community since 2002. I'm providing direct services. I always felt like it, being amongst the people that I had a good feel for, for what we needed. But I knew that was me based on my personal and professional experience in the, in the community providing direct services. So, which is one of the ways to do it. Definitely, uh, I ensure that we're a part of the community, uh, take part in the, their events, uh, staffing tables at various uh, events within the community on and off the reservation. And, um, the the bigger piece that I found in, in was this uh, sexual violence in tribal community. Walking through that piece with the evaluator, and, and we went back and forth on language and, and context and uh, uh, tribal context, and of course the United States context. And it was inter interesting discussion on on what we needed to do, and and the advisory members that we had were. Uh, employees from the tribe, but also survivors uh, from the tribe, from the community, people who had an invested interest in seeing safety for uh, survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. First and foremost, always, always being the community, gaining their trust. That's um, the purpose of our program is we are here to gain the trust of our community. And for us, that means confidentiality. Uh, so when we did the uh, surveys and the assessments, uh, we also put it back out to our community. So we don't hold it to ourselves. We share the, the information that we gained to the community so that they know that we're working on these pieces. And when they catch us in the street or at the events, we explained where we're at with those pieces. So always being in, in touch with the community. Uh, and, and, I, and I never... I would say everybody. So, so even the naysayers, those who who don't believe in the work that we're doing or have uh, negative aspects about what we do, invite them because more often than not, they they've got some pieces that I've never looked at, or they end up being a, a a good community member who wants to help us out in other areas. And and definitely do not just stick with the elders. Talk to our youth, and that's the whole piece about having our staff in the high school 
and keeping them involved because they have other ways of, of um, looking at what we're trying to get accomplished also. Hopefully I've answered that question. Thank you, Desiree. Anything others want to add? Okay, Michelle, we have lots of people that like you to repeat the training that you mentioned. I think they're going to jot it down and look it up. We will send an email to everyone with links, but if you wouldn't mind just repeating that, Michelle, they can take a look. Sure. Do you want me to put those in the chat? Yeah, that would be great. Great. Thank I can you. do that. Okay. Um, let's have, since Michelle's done something in the chat, <laughs> I won't ask her to do a question. Um, let's see. Uh, Shelly, there's a question here just on kind of outreach and engagement. They were asking specifically about college students, but you talked a little bit about looking at your referrals and where they're coming from and building relationships. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that? And if it makes sense to talk about college students, that'd be great too. Um, the college students that I have, um, their referrals to us. So when um, they're leaving the community and they are going to school, about hooking them up um, to possibly the um, school counselor, or there is domestic violence, sexual assault programs in the area. Um, as long as we have a release of information, we can talk and then they continue the supports. I know a lot of them are interested in the domestic violence education or the sexual assault education, depending where it is. Um, they also, um, I have assisted in um, court orders, transferring court orders, working with the courts if we're getting information for protection. Um, sometimes the perpetrators follow them. Um, they're still a victim and they're still in the courts and they're still entitled to be protected, whether they're relocating college or just basically relocating in general. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Okay, Michelle, this is one for you. Um, how hard is it to apply and receive a federal grant for a tribe? Well, um, the first time I did it, it was a little overwhelming, <laughs> but um, we have in the past utilized a grant writer. Um, as I got comfortable doing it myself, um, it's, it's really, it's a formula. So you just follow the outline, um, the requirements of the funding agency, provide your backup documentation, make sure that you have a really thorough proposal, uh, a good solid budget narrative, and whatever their, their budget requirements. Some you know need a budget detail worksheet, some you can submit on your own, um, have the appropriate sign-offs, um, disclosure forms, you know, disclose to your funding agencies what other fund sources that you're receiving awards from. Um, definitely, you know, just ensure there's always checklists. Make sure you hit every mark on every checklist. Um, they basically tell you how to submit the grant. Um, so it's not, not too difficult after your first or second time doing it, you're going to be a pro at it already. Um, definitely reach out to um, TAs, um, any assistance through those agencies for any help because they're they're there to help you get the money. Um, and it, ask your colleagues too. You know anybody else who's done it before, um, they will help you through it. Um, I mine was kind of a trial and error. You know, thrown into it here, write your first grant. Um, but as I as I go, it gets a lot easier. Um, and if anybody ever has any questions on how to do that, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll, I'll help wherever I can. Thank you, Michelle. Desiree, I saw you nodding. So jump in. I know you've done this a few times. So uh, what I wanted to add to Michelle is as you're writing that, your proposal, the title for each question I would add those in there so that you answer each one, even if it's one that you are not going to respond to or you have a negative or you, doesn't apply to you, put that in there and say not applicable. 
Um, so answer every single one of them in order and put in as much detail. You're, you're painting the picture of what you want to do for your area. And the people who are reviewing those, they don't know your area or who you have in your area to help you out. So paint a good picture of, of your area, your service needs, and how you're gonna accomplish the goals and objectives. Thank you, Desiree. Michelle? That's a really great point, Desiree, um, because I know our geographic area, it covers multi-jurisdictional lines, and I'm sure that's the same way with all other tribes. You have your federal, your state, your tribal, and here we have international, we have Canada and the United States as well. So the more clear you are with your geographic area, especially us rural folk, how far away are the hospitals? You know, how far away are your local police stations in order to be able to respond? Um, things like that are really important. The more details, it's not gonna hurt you. It's just gonna help when you're writing the proposal. Um, so just really and, and think about, you know, plan for incidentals too, because <laughs> we're, you know, we find that, um, you know, we had ended up with water damage um, in our shelter in the floor. So we're going to have to go after money to kind of help repair that. Otherwise we have a, you know, a good inch gap underneath one of our doors and critters are going to get in. So, you know, just make sure that um, you're, you're really taking a holistic view of, of the programs and services um, and your buildings, <laughs> your buildings too, because you're going to want to know. <laughs> Michelle, you just reminded me, I think our largest cost that I didn't put in there was um, advertising. So we need advertising the newspaper. That cost a lot, even for a tribal newspaper or local newspapers, put in a lot of money for that. Or if you're going to do uh, PSAs on the radio, put money in that per quarter. You're going to need that. Thank you both. I also want to add that the Office for Victims of Crime has resources, no matter where you are in this process, if you've never applied for one, if you have applied for one, you're looking for ways to expand into different areas, there are a lot of resources. So the OBC has a Tribal Victim Services Capacity Building and Technical Assistance Program. We work exclusively with tribal communities. They're a great resource. And then the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center is also available if you want to expand into that area of um, being ready to support survivors of human trafficking. So love what you both mentioned that you don't have to do it alone. There are lots of resources for support. Make sure you're reading the, the grant applications and apply, right? You get feedback, you could try again. There's a comment in the chat that we're always learning. So keep, keep, keep going after it. Okay, um, reminder to participants, keep dropping your questions in. Um, I have a question here on, it's kind of related to this. So once you get a grant, um, what help is available to you in managing um, the, the grant funding? Um, Desiree, do you wanna take that one first? Sure. Uh -huh. So I often go back to my uh, grant manager and visit with her uh, about where I want to go and why I want to do what I want to do. And, and um, she'll have other resources or make me think through some of the different steps in case I'm missing something. And um, if there's, if it's like a project that doesn't quite fit what my grant manager is trying to get to, like um, if I wanted to do more around um, uh, mental health and sexual assault, then I uh, would look at the TA to TA website to see what uh, technical assistance agencies that OVW currently has. But I also look locally to um, like these uh, sexual assault task force. They have a lot of um, professionals who are across the state, but uh, various disciplines. So if I need any more information from them, I, I know I can tap them for information. I often will uh, visit my uh, tribal sisters, like um, uh, Lisa Bruner or, or Sarah Deer or Tewa Woman United. Um, 
uh, in regards to the tribal aspects that I want to get to. Uh, yeah, so whomever you can find. <laughs> but I always start off with the grant manager and making sure I, I'm fitting within the parameters that we said we would uh, abide by. But yeah, when you find people that are, are that you can tap, reach out, ask. Happy to share our ideas and our experiences. Thank you, Desiree. Okay, there's a question here on just jurisdictions. So Michelle, since you mentioned you have a very large service area, tribes or sovereign nations, um, how have you addressed some of the complexities that that happens and kind of lean on your partners and supporting that as well? Yeah, that's something we're still working on. Um, it's it's hard. Um, we have victims, um, our, our service area, basically our, tri our tribe, tribal territory encompasses Quebec, Ontario, our tribal lands, New York State in two different counties, St. Lawrence County and Franklin County, because this is where we're typically receiving all of our victims from. So the first thing that we have to do is establish relationships with all the service providers in those specific areas. Um, our, our tribe has two separate tribal, tribal governments. We have the St. Regis Mohawk tribe on the American side and on the Canadian side, we have the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. Um, so we have to work very closely with the service providers over there to see, first of all, whose jurisdiction is it going to be to serve the victims? And then if it is our jurisdiction, um, where are we going to go for these services? It could be a woman who resides on the American side, but her abuse occurred in Canada because we don't really recognize the border on the territory here. Um, so you really get, need to get to know all your service providers in your general area, work as closely as you can with your police agencies, um, know your points of contact, know the people who are specifically working with the victims. And right now we're completing a, a justice survey um, under a grant uh, where I'm a part of the um, Justice Advisory Board. We're trying to overcome a lot of these jurisdictional issues say somebody's not recognizing um, ICWA, for example, um, our St. Lawrence County doesn't like to recognize ICWA. They don't like to abide by ICWA. So we're working on how to resolve that. Um, how are we gonna network with all of our, our partner providers? Um, it's a challenge and it's, and it's always going to be a challenge. Um, I know other tribes have to do a lot more with the federal um, they have the, the, you know, the FBI and things like that mixed in where we're lucky is we don't have to really deal with that. It's mostly local and state um, and provincial, but um, you know, it's gonna apply either way. Know your points of contact um, and, and establish a very good working relationship. Um, Shelly might be able to speak to you know, the jurisdictional issues um, as well. Yeah, whenever um, they could live on the Canadian side, the crime happened on the American side. Um, like I did have a sexual assault. She did not want to go to Canada, but that's where her health care was. So we had to go through Indian Health Services, go get the rape kit done, and then sign releases. So it went from the hospital to the tribal police department. We have a memorandum of understanding that went to the Okasasne Mohawk Police. And then from there, it had to go to Valleyfield, Quebec because of the territory where the assault actually happened. So that's what I'm saying. Know your community, be friends, get out there. You, you really gotta know, I mean, paperwork from one county is switching to the other county. You're acknowledged in one, you're not acknowledged in another, but it's like, you got to be out there like me. I'm the advocate, so I need to be out there and I'm going to be asking you 100 questions and I'm not going to go away. So don't avoid me. Just pick up your phone because I'm going to call you again tomorrow. So that's the best way to get answers. It's like I better just talk to her now. And um, dealing with a rape case wouldn't answer me. Then I decide I'm just going to go to the police station and I need to talk to someone. 
So I locked out. I talked to his boss. We got answers. They went right back to the Crown. So now we're waiting for results uh, from the Crown attorney uh, on a rape case. So, I mean, sometimes as an advocate, you just got to step out of your comfort zone and you're advocating because, you know, um, the people we're dealing with, they're scared. Um, you know, they're traumatized and we have to be their voice for them. So um, just know your community and know what's out there. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I wanted to end, we're coming close to the end of our time together here and so much good information has been shared. So thank you all. Um, and Shelley, I love that reminder that advocate means you're advocating on behalf of someone else and that's sometimes not easy to do. So I'm glad we closed with that. I would like to ask each of you just to take a minute or two and share what um, you hope someone will take away from this conversation today. And Michelle, let's start with you. Um, I hope we were able to, you know, provide some valuable information on, you know, on my part, you know, maintaining your staff, retaining your staff. Um, and I just want to keep reiterating that, um, you know, it's very important work, um, what we do, but you need to take care of yourself too. Um, don't be afraid to take your mental health and your well being and your health care and make that a priority so that you can be of service to others. Um, and I just want to offer that if anybody has any questions, um, I think you all have my contact information. Uh, I have not been doing this particular job for that long. I've been in this position for six months, but um, I have you know experience in tribal government for 18 years. So please reach out. Um, I, I'm more than happy to, to help anybody. Thank you, Michelle. Shelly, let's go to you next. Um, the biggest thing is listen, listen to your clients, listen to the victims. Um, this is the hardest thing that they do is reaching out to you. So just listen to them, believe what they say. This is their version. This is what they believe happened. So believe them, um, support them, be the support that they need. Listen to them. You can have conversations with them. And the biggest thing you can do is never judge them because we don't know what they've been through. No two people experience trauma the same. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Desiree? Definitely agree with what Michelle and Shelley had said in regards to hopes with what people can take away from here. And, and for me, I just want to add on to that, that um, context is important. I mean, the, not just your context, but the systems that you operate by, which is not a good system because it's United States based, but that's what we operate by. Understand that that context as an individual and as a system doesn't truly connect with our community people that we're serving, especially tribal communities. From their context is how we should be serving them, how we assist them in, in walking through their the traumas and their successes. Um, be amongst the people. Don't, don't sit at your office or sit at your desk or sit in meetings. Be in the community. Listen to them. Not just the elders, the all of them, the young and the old, um, they have so much history, so much trauma, but they also have uh, insight to uh, how we can do better in serving them uh, for a better, a better community. And, and never, 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 never forget, we are a sovereign nation. We are the only ones that can yield as, as far as communities of color or nonprofits. We are the only ones who can wield sovereignty. So stand in that. Strike forward in your knowledge, your professional skills, and your tribally specific skills so that we can all move towards a sovereign, healthy nation. 
And thank you again very much for being here. I appreciate you, Michelle, Shelley, Tracy, and uh, Greg for the opportunity to be part of this panel. It, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Desiree. Um, <clears throat> before we close, um, Greg's joined us to close us out in a good way. Please take a moment to answer our poll. Um, we will email each of you a recording of this discussion, links to the resources and panelists contact information. So please continue to reach out if you have questions after this session or need help in any way. Um, there's a link to register for that upcoming tribal um, consultation about the tribal um, victim services set aside program. So there are just lots of resources and we hope you take something away with you from this conversation. Now, Greg, I invite you to join us again and offer our closing. Thank you so much. Oh, me, Dr. Yopi, appreciate you all for your conversations and willing to learn more avenues and uh, build yourself up to offer more services to people. <clears throat> the song I offer for us to close is a song of giving thanks for what just took place. The song says, uh, it talks to the creator, to grandfather, uh, about the life that was created um, in the conversation. Wichoni Wamayonkuelo talks about the life that was created. Uh, and it goes to say that we prayed for these things and we talked about these things. Um, and this center is very powerful and sacred. It goes on to say that that the creator was was listening to us on this day is very powerful and it gives thanks to the creator in, in the utmost form of uh, gratitude so if you will at this time bear with me Thank you all. Thank you, Greg. That was beautiful. And thank you again to everyone for being here today. We look forward to having you join a future Talking Circle webinar. Take care.